Good evening and welcome to this evening's feature presentation, our local history spotlight, remembering the lives lost in Oshawa from the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, our land acknowledgement is something that we always talk about at the beginning of our presentations. I'll be reading this now and I'll have you reflect on what's being said. The land we are standing on today is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We acknowledge that Oshawa is covered under the Williams Treaties, and as settler on these lands, we are all treaty people. May we respectfully honor the knowledge and understanding of the Indigenous stewards of these ancestral lands and ensure that the voices of the First Peoples are represented in our collections, programs, and services. So this evening, we're going to be looking at the impact of the 1918 flu pandemic uh, and what it had on Canada, as well as the town of Oshawa. Oshawa Museum staff, Melissa Cole, curator, and Laura Suchin, executive director, will share research that shows how devastating the flu pandemic was in Oshawa, including a look at how many influenza victims from the 1918 pandemic were buried in Oshawa's Union Cemetery and a glimpse into their family history. I will turn it over now to Melissa. Well, thank you very much, Nicole. And uh, thank you everyone for joining Laura and I this evening uh, virtually. Um, we're looking forward to uh, sharing some of our research tonight. Uh, we'll begin tonight's presentation uh, with myself and I'll be taking a look um, at the flu pandemic, specifically in the town of Oshawa, 1918. And we'll look at some other pandemics as well that happened just prior to that, um, such as typhoid fever and such. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen. And I think everybody should be able to see that. So it was just over 100 years ago that the province of Ontario, including the town of Oshawa, had experienced a public health crisis that resembles our today's COVID-19. From 1918 to 1920, the Spanish influenza swept the world and killed 50 million people worldwide, taking the lives of young and otherwise healthy adults. The Spanish influenza started in February 1918 while the First World War was ongoing and approaching its end, creating the ideal environment for the flu to infect, multiply, and spread rapidly across the globe. It reached the United States in March of 1918, and it reached Canada through troop, hospital, and civilian ships. The ports of Montreal and Halifax were some of the main routes of infection into Canada. It was by late June and early July that it spread across the country via the railway. According to public health authorities, the failure to restrict train travel early on was one of the most terrible oversights. It came in multiple waves. The first wave took place in the spring of 1918, and then, in the, and then it followed again in the fall of 1918. A mutation of the influenza virus produced an extremely contagious and deadly form of the disease. This second wave caused 90% of the deaths and occurred during the pandemic. That had occurred during the pandemic. Subsequent waves also took place in the spring of 1919 and again in the spring of 1920. It's funny to say that this pandemic was also known as the forgotten pandemic. I can truly say I don't think it will be anymore. So right now we're just going to take a look at a few other pandemics that happened in Oshawa just to kind of get an idea of what was taking place prior to 1918 and just looking at the public health um, um, community as well. So an article from the Oshawa Vindicator, um, which is right here um, in my, on, on this slide from, um, from April 19th, 1971 states, and I'm going to quote from this article. Two great causes of typhoid fever in this place are the dirty roads and the dirty cellars. The northwest corner of King and Simcoe streets may be termed the fever corner of the town, as more cases arose in this location than any other in the area. The area does not drain, there's stagnant green water that lies in pools along the ground, and the owners of the property should really take responsibility to ensure their property is properly drained and have proper drains dug. Because of decaying vegetables that are allowed to accumulate may account for the disease in many households. Any man who values his family should attend to this matter at once, and in the end it would be found much cheaper to pay, to pay the drain digger than the doctor. Uh, the population of the town of Oshawa in 1879 was around 3,800 people. 
So this image here is from um, an Oshawa fire insurance map. And you can kind of see where um, the tanks are, like the reservoirs that would be holding uh, the water and why the drainage um, from like rotting vegetables, um, potential butchers as well. Um, just there was, there was no garbage, like weekly garbage pickup at the time as well. So a lot of refuge and stuff would be left in the streets. And then that matter ends up getting into the drinking water and then leading to um, things like typhoid fever. Oshawa's first board of health. So shortly after Oshawa had been hit by typhoid fever, Oshawa's first board of health was started in 1884 when a bylaw was created, number 285. It was passed by town council to establish a board of health. The members of this board included Dr. Francis Ray, Lyman Smith, Robert McLaughlin, Mr. Tamlin, G.A. G. A. Jones, William Redwin, Mr. Mallory, Mr. Booth, and a William Glenny. The town sanitary inspector was William Holleran. The first recommendation by the Board of Health was the passage of a bylaw, making the inspection of the town's milk supply um, compulsory for all dairies that supply milk to the town and they must obtain a license and their, or their premises would be inspected. Cleanup week was initiated in 1890 and it asked citizens to clean up their backyards. In 1903, the board purchased a formaldehyde generator that was used by doctors to disinfect homes of infectious um, from disinfecting homes uh, where infectious, infectious diseases had been treated. And then in 1905, outbreaks of smallpox, scarlet fever, and uh, diphtheria had occurred in the town. You see two images here, um, which is taken from the uh, Provincial Board of Health um, report from 1905. Patients were either isolated in their homes or there's been mention of a home on Park Road South. Um, and I've tried to delve into a bit more research about it, but I've just seen mention of it once. And this home was actually used to isolate patients. In this report from the Provincial Board of Health in 1905, it states that Oshawa was one of the towns to take it upon themselves to form a waterworks. This would allow for sanitary drinking water um, and a, a fresh supply of water as well. And it also meant for the proper disposal of sewage and filth so that the mortality rates um, would, be, would largely be decreased in the town. Now we're gonna take a look at how the flu of 1918 impacted Oshawa. In Canada, the numbers are, are not exactly known. It was from anywhere from 30,000 to 50,000 people actually died from uh, the flu. It was obviously accelerated by complications such as um, pneumonia. In Ontario, it's reported 300,000 cases and 8,705 deaths were recorded. But these figures likely don't tell the whole story. Medical systems were overwhelmed, meaning that many fatalities almost certainly went unreported. This is evident in reports that were sent in from local medical officers of health. Between 1918 and 1919, Oshawa had a population of approximately 10,000, and there were just over 300 deaths in total, but not, that's just total deaths, not just from influenza. And this figure is um, taken from uh, the Provincial Board of Health report. Just like today, we tend to think of the young and the elderly as being most at risk, but most, most of those who died during the Spanish flu epidemic were between the ages of 20 and 40, the same demographic already decimated by the First World War. In Canada, the provinces of Quebec and Alberta were the most severely affected, which is one of the reasons why archives like the Glenbow Archives in Alberta have a wealth of information related to public health in the Spanish flu. Another unfortunate thing is during our research is of course the lack of um, Oshawa newspapers from this time as well. We had a few editions um, of the newspapers from 1918 and what's surprisingly is that there's very little mention of the flu pandemic in the papers at that time. And it may be because of the dates um, of the papers that we had there earlier on in 1918. And maybe at that time, it just hadn't quite um, reached high levels and we're just missing the papers from that time. So other local papers and other communities such as Port Perry um, and Whitby um, and Clarington as well, we were able to access those papers. And Laura will talk a little bit more about that later on as well. In 1918, the Spanish flu also swept through the maternity hospital that was located at Llewellyn Hall. 
and it was reported that 95% of the babies in the ward passed away. Unfortunately, these numbers were not accounted for or submitted to the Provincial Board of Health as a direct relation to the Spanish flu. But this might have been the reason why 53 infants under the age of one had died that year. <clears throat> when the pandemic hit Oshawa, there were also a few articles that um, I found that mentioned that the armories actually were a location um, where they would treat the sick because the hospital at the time had just opened in 1910 and it would have been quite overwhelmed as well. Uh, churches and schools were said to have been closed and we must remember there was actually no vaccine at the time as well. So here's another image. So this particular image is from um, the 1919 Provincial Board of Health report. The following year in 1919, it was reported by Dr. Mackay, that the who was the medical officer of health for Oshawa, that the town was actually not greatly impacted by the Spanish flu in 1918, which is indicated, which you can see on this chart, by the decrease in deaths attributed to the freedom of the town from the Spanish flu epidemic. Interestingly, though, when you continue to read through the rest of the report, he talks about how the numbers are reported and notes that it's actually impossible due to the housing problems and the reporting. Many houses were under construction, numerous individuals were unemployed. Um, this was probably due to the war and the flu or other illnesses. Um, many are living in shacks and partly built dwellings. Therefore, they, quote, escape the notice of the official recorders. So many of these numbers really don't truly indicate how many did die from the flu. There was most likely many, many more. And although the, although the government had set gathering limits, it did not stop the celebrations from happening in our street. And uh, this is our community celebrating in the streets of Oshawa with the armistice parade that took place in November 1919. It would be the following year in, in, um, in 1919 when the, sorry, the parade was taking place in November 1918. It would be the following year in 1919 when Oshawa and the surrounding communities would be hit the hardest by the Spanish influenza. So I'm now going to turn it over to Laura um, and she's going to talk about her research um, ut utilizing uh, death records um, and looking at those buried in Union Cemetery. Okay, thank you, Melissa. Can you advance the slide? Perfect. Recently, one of my colleagues shared news of a project that she was involved in to honor the more than 700 people who succumbed to influenza during the 1918 pandemic in the Wellington region of New Zealand. More than 650 people succumbed just during the months of November and December 1918 and many of those were buried in Kairori Cemetery on the outskirts of Wellington. The graves were unattended and more or less lost from the collective memory. So this two-year project was designed to restore and remember those who died during the pandemic. The idea was to clean and tidy the grave plots, clean the headstones, re and research the family histories of at least 75 of those people. Sm small white crosses that you can see in the photo uh, were used to mark the graves of the flu victims. The work was all done by volunteers and working bees and it was done in association with the cemetery management, the staff, and also with this Wellington City Council. The latest project post that I'm showing here on the screen uh, indicates that they've managed to put in these brightly colored pillars that contain QR codes where you can go in and scan the QR, QR code and it takes you to a website explaining the family histories of at least 175 victims of the flu. So this whole project prompted me to start thinking about Oshawa and the people that were buried in Oshawa's Union Cemetery. And I wondered how many influenza victims were there and really what were their stories. So I started doing a bit of research into this and I wanna share a bit of that with you tonight. To just see how devastating the flu pandemic was in Oshawa, I turned to the Ontario Canada Deaths and Deaths Overseas 
database, 1869 to 1948, for the town of Oshawa. I started with October 1st, 1918, and worked until March 31st, 1919. And if you remember from the beginning of Melissa's presentation, she did mention that the fall of 1918 was a wave of the flu pandemic, and then also another one in the spring of 1919. So I decided to focus on those six months to start. So with this database, I was able to search for any cause of death, which was listed as influenza, Spanish flu, and flu. And also, as Melissa mentioned, sometimes the flu developed into pneumonia. So I also took particular, um, uh, a particular look at any deaths that were associated with uh, pneumonia. Sometimes the coroner would list pneumonia following the flu. So if influenza was mentioned at all in the record, I included the death. Of course, this is not in any means a scientific uh, review of the data. However, there was some observations that I was able to make. So for that period, that six month period, the total deaths for the number of people who died as a result of the flu or an illness following an episode of the flu during the six month period was 50. Of those 50 deaths, 23 deaths were reported in those 25 years of age or younger. So we're looking at almost a half of the recorded deaths being in a quite young portion of the population. The youngest victim was only two months old. The oldest victim was 70 years. Of the 50 deaths due to influenza, 30 of them were buried in Union Cemetery, at least 30 of them. There could be more because in many cases, there was no burial location recorded. So I just went with the ones that specifically said Union Cemetery. October 1918 was the deadliest month that I uh, looked at. That was uh, the week of October 27th to November um, second was actually the deadliest week in the six month period. There were 16 of the 50 deaths occurring during that week. The previous week, there were 15 deaths. So th these two weeks in um, October accounted for more than half the deaths reported in the entire six month period. Uh, October 1918, was by far the deadliest death, um, deadliest month for deaths with 35 deaths, followed by November with seven deaths, February there was four deaths, December 1918, three deaths, and by the time we hit January 1919, we were reporting only one death due to flu, and by March, zero deaths for the entire month actually had flu listed. So now I wanted to talk just briefly about some of the people that are listed in these statistics. So I'd like to always kind of recover some of their family stories so that they're not just statistics. They become, um, you know, they were real uh, people that had families. And uh, this is kind of our way of honoring some of these people that died during the pandemic. One of them was Marjorie Hoig Lander. And you might recognize the two last names. They're, they're two uh, well-known surnames in Oshawa. Uh, Mar Marjorie Lander was a young mother. She had at least three p uh, children when she passed away from influenza on November 7th, 1918. She was the daughter of Oshawa's Dr. Hoig, who was not only one of Oshawa's longest serving physicians, but also the author of the book, Reminiscences and Recollections, where he details uh, some of Oshawa's history, looking at some interesting characters. Marjorie ended up marrying the coal merchant, Elgin Vesta Lander in 1910. And Lander Coal and Wood Merchant was a um, 
a well-known name in the town for many, for many years. He had a storefront at 43 King Street West on the south side, just east of Center Street. And the couple lived at 221 Simcoe Street North, just south of Parkwood. They had two daughters, Alice and Virginia, who were born in 1913 and 1915, followed by a son, David, in 1917. Marjorie was only 31 years old when she died of the flu. Her husband Elgin remarried in 1927 and died in 1976, and both of them are buried in Union Cemetery. This is one of the saddest stories that I came across while I was uh, doing my research. Gladys McGregor. Gladys was only 13 years old when she, she died of the flu in 1919. The entire year 1919 was not a good year for the McGregor family. Not only did daughter's, daughter Gladys die, but father Robert McGregor, who was a harness maker, he died in June from tuberculosis. And then the mother Lucy died in November from uh, nephritis or swelling of the kidney. All three of them are buried in Union Cemetery. Taking a look at this a snapshot from the census record, this is from 1911. We see Robert and Lucy and also Gladys, but we can see that there's also three other children, uh, at least three other children in the family. And the final name is Robert's mother. She passed away in the fall of 1918. So within one year, Mary Jane McGregor, Robert, Lucy, and Gladys were all dead. And that left at least these three other children orphaned by their parents' deaths. And on the right-hand side, we can see the um, death notice from the Port Perry paper for Robert McGregor. As Melissa mentioned, we don't have a lot of surviving newspapers from 1918 and 1919. So I felt, uh, I felt a bit fortunate that Robert McGregor and his family were actually from Port Perry. So that's why they were uh, listed in the Port Perry newspaper for their deaths. This uh, gentleman was uh, an interesting gentleman, Sergeant Leonard Menzoni Crawford. He's got quite, a, quite an elaborate uh, gravestone in Union Cemetery. A lot of his family uh, is listed on it as well, his parents. Uh, Leonard was a 28-year-old clerk when he passed away in December 1918 from the flu. He had served in France during World War I with the 116th Battalion. He enlisted in 1916, and I found it quite interesting that on his enlistment papers, he listed his occupation as an auto mechanic. So just thinking about 1916 and how early that is in the history of the automobile, that uh, Leonard was an automobile mechanic. During March 1917, Leonard was marching with his unit near Vimy, France, when he slipped on the snow and fractured his kneecap. He was treated in France and England before he was finally sent home to Canada to convalesce. He spent some months um, convalescing, but his knee never got back to uh, strength, and he was um, discharged uh, from the army in 1918 and became, uh, began working as a clerk. But in December of that uh, year, he died of the flu. So the the poor sergeant survived World War I and uh, seeing um, action in France only to come home and uh, die of the flu. Input. All right, next one is a, another uh, World War I veteran by the name of Alexander Swanky. He was a private with 37th Battalion and he also fought in France. He was born in Scotland in 1891, and his trade was listed as machinist. 
According to his attestation papers, he signed up for the military in Niagara, 1915. He was discharged from the 60th Battalion in early 1917 as the result also of a knee injury. And he was an outpatient uh, treatment in Toronto until October 31st, 1918. In February 1919, he died at the age of 27 from pneumonia and influenza. And we see a picture here of his gravestone in Union Cemetery. The last couple I'd like to talk about, I unfortunately don't have a picture of their tombstones, but they are Melvin and Rose Babcock. They were married in 1900 and both died within one week of each other from the flu. Melville was the first to pass away on October 21st, 1918 at the Oshawa Hospital after suffering from the flu for one week and pneumonia for three days. Rose is listed as the informant for Melville's death. Six days later, on October 27th, Rose also succumbed to the flu at the Oshawa Hospital. She is buried in Union Cemetery, as noted in the death register. However, there was no burial location noted for her husband, but there's a good possibility that he is also in Union Cemetery. So these are some of the things that I, I want to get out and um, research to find these tombstones in Union Cemetery to see if he is actually buried there as well. So that's just a small snippet of some of the stories of the people in Oshawa who passed away in the flu, the great flu pandemic of 1918. As I said, there was 50 in total, 30 buried in Union Cemetery. Research is ongoing and, uh, you know, we hope to recover the stories starting with all the people that are in Union Cemetery and then moving on to the other 20. So at this point, we wonder if you have any questions for us regarding the flu pandemic. <laughs> Thank you so much, Laura and Melissa. That was just fascinating. I know um, it's always the case we're missing newspapers from that time period, right? Um, and I meant to mention to you, I found yesterday, someone donated, I work at the Oshawa Library, of course, someone walked in with a donation of old newspapers oh. from October of 1918. And on the front page, and I didn't have time to scan it, she came in just before we closed yesterday, um, came in yesterday, with it, it talks about the pandemic and the vaccine, and I will be scanning it and sending it on to you so you can have a copy. Fantastic. Um, it just didn't come in in time. Um, this woman actually had uh, saved these papers from when her parents died in the 70s, and then she moved to Florida. She came up just this week to bring the papers back and to visit family. So she brought this stack of papers back from, and it included two papers from 1918. And I was just floored. <laughs> oh, I guess. So you never know when those things are gonna come up. Um, if pe people have any questions, they can pop them in the chat and I'll read them aloud. Um, or if you like, um, you can unmute yourself to ask the question. We'll ask you to leave your video off though. Um, I'll just start with, uh, I guess, what did you find most surprising in your research, Laura, into, into the figuring out how many people there were in Oshawa that died of the flu? I think what I found um, most interesting is similar to what Melissa mentioned that, you know, we often think of the flu as, as affecting really um, some of the older population. So it, I was quite surprised when I saw that the large number of people that were actually, um, you know, as I said, under 25 that uh, passed away from the flu. And, and I know that this is just the tip of the iceberg because as, as I was going through the records, you know, there was a lot of pneumonias in there and, um, you know, other diseases. Melissa and I had just read an article today about uh, one of the doctors mentioning how people that suffered from the flu uh, they're, they then often contract something like tuberculosis. So they might not have died strictly from the flu, but from the tuberculosis um, several months later, but that's not recorded as a flu death. So I, I think uh, it was the age of the people and also just knowing that there's probably so many more that um, 
you know, it just wasn't specified as the flu. And, and as I said, if, if it didn't have the word flu in it, I did not include it. Well, um, we have a question coming in from John, who's asking mm -hmm. if we know what the source of the 1982 <laughs> pandemic was. That's very controversial. <laughs> it is, and you're right, Nicole. Um, I can take, I can answer that one because I was trying to delve into that a little bit, and there is no answer to that, and it is very controversial. Controversial. One thing I did note, though, was that it most likely didn't start in Spain, like they say. Um, it is possible that it, it most likely started in either China, France, or even possibly the US. Um, and due to the censorship of the war, um, their newspapers and stuff weren't as accessible. So Spain was the first to report it, whereas the others most likely weren't going to necessarily report it. So there's even controversy around the name of it. Nobody wants to have a flu like that named after their, like, <laughs> with their country name in it, but because they were the first to report it, that was one thing I did um, find through my research is that it possibly did not originate. It most likely didn't originate in Spain, but unfortunately, I, the source is unknown. Even now with our modern technology, I think it's hard to, you know, they know that it, it most likely uh, our current pandemic is yes. originated in Wuhan, China, but there's controversy yeah. about that too. And people wanting to call it a Chinese, like, you know, of course it's not the Chinese epidemic or like this wasn't the Spanish epidemic, but that's, they call it from where it, where, where it is originated. So some things never change, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, and I see there's another question. Same, John was asking about, uh, mm -hmm. The first reports of soldiers coming back that was one of the areas that they stated that that's how it was coming into canada was through ships um, that were coming into uh, port at montreal and halifax um so even civilian ships troops um so various ships that were coming in um so i don't know exactly um when the first reports were of the soldiers coming back but i do believe it was 1918 when they were coming um into port uh, there's another question here, actually just a comment, I think, from Janet, saying that the gravestone of soldiers that you see in the cemetery um, with the maple leaf on top and in an oblong shape, like long and thin and white, uh, provided by the government of Canada. So those were um, ones that um, Veterans Affairs provided, I believe. Like the, the ones that were, um, sorry, not, not, not Veterans Affairs, um, the government of Canada, I don't know exactly what she's referring to here. Do you know anything about that and why it had a maple leaf on top? Well, it's pretty well the standard um, um, gravestone for soldiers. There's quite a few of them that I've seen around for um, anyone that um, was a soldier who died. The, the government had a particular style of gravestone. Mm -hmm. So uh, I believe talking about Alex Swanky uh gravestones the one with the yep. uh maple leaf on yeah yeah it was the soldiers it's what made me think of veterans affairs it's like those were ones provided because there was the one man who was in the recently in the military so he was provided yeah. with a government headstone yeah that's uh, an interesting question there yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the question is, uh, was there an echo epidemic in fall of winter 19, 1920, like what is happening with COVID-19? There was, um, but from my understanding, it wasn't as bad in the in late 1919 and 1920. The variants were not as strong as they were in 19 in late 1918 and early 1919. Um, I've read a couple of reports on that, and that's what the articles are saying. Um, so it, it's just interesting of how long it continued, just mirroring it with our COVID-19. Yeah, it was interesting. Uh, uh, the staff was, I still remember this, we were talking at the beginning of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, and we were saying, you know, if, if it lasts as long as the flu did, that there was actually other waves of it that weren't, you know, maybe as um, deadly. But we, we knew that in even in 1920, there was a wave of it. So we thought, you know, hopefully COVID doesn't doesn't last as long as the flu pandemic did. It's interesting that the articles noted that the fact that they didn't stop train travel, um, they allowed it to continue, so therefore allowing it to spread. Um, 
very similar to here, controversial over airports and travel early on. And you see, you're just seeing similar stories um, being told in the media. And it was interesting too, the um, photo of the parade um, yeah. in November, 1918, you couldn't keep people inside. There no was way. no social distancing. That <laughs> just sort of um, everybody celebrating the end of the war. Yeah. Um, and of course the returning soldiers, as you mentioned, and then they came back and spread it everywhere. Um, in some cases that they had it themselves when they came back. Yeah. yeah. Janet mentioned um, a vaccine for Spanish flu. Did they come out with a vaccine for the um, the influenza in 1918? I don't believe so. They had a vaccine for smallpox, which I think people get confused with, but I don't believe the Spanish flu ever had a vaccine. So I'm I'm not sure. Like most articles I read, they, they stated there was no um, vaccine for it, at least early on. But I do know they had one for smallpox, which I sometimes think might be where the confusion is, but I don't believe there was a vaccine. I could be wrong. Like they might have developed one later on, but I know there wasn't one early on. I don't know if there's any, any questions that anyone wants to ask verbally. If they don't want to type, um, they can. Um... I'm just reading that one that just came in. Mm -hmm. I have him on my list. I was going to say, I recognize that last name. Though. William Wassel yep. lost their only sons, William Wassel. Uncle Edward Wassel. I'm going to, I'll add, um, I don't have Edward on my list, but I definitely have William uh, oh. Wassel, and he is buried in Union, I believe. Oh, wow. Thank you for, you know, mentioning mm -hmm. that it was uh, your great grandparents, Mr. and Mrs. William Wassel, lost their only sons. Your grandfather, William Wassell Jr. and great uncle Edward Wassell in 1918, all Oshawa residents. Thank you for that. Yeah, hi, sorry, it says it says from me, it's Wendy. I, I didn't realize I had to type my name in there. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Wendy. Yeah, yeah thank You're you welcome. for sharing. Thank You're you, welcome. yes. Uh, do they have any idea what animal this uh, 1918 flu uh, originated in? There's a lot of controversy over that as well, um, and you can you can even do some research into even quick googling and see some articles that do talk about it. And um, I I don't know too much just because it is such a controversial topic. They have recovered the original virus, so that's why I'm interested. Yeah, and well, they they say the virus that we're battling today is there are all these all these flu viruses are connected with the N1H, I believe it's N1H1. Um, I'm not a scientist, so I don't want to like mess up anything and say something wrong, but um, it, our flu that this COVID one that we're battling right now is connected. Um, there's strains of it that have been going for years and years and years. And some strains are lighter than others. Um, it's continually changing with the environment and yeah, it appears to be, according to scientists, uh, that uh, these coronaviruses uh, jump back and forward between um, uh, different species of mammals and uh, human beings that yes. are close to them. And this time, for some reason, it's uh, virulent. So. And that's it. I did read that. I did read um, actually a recent article that talks about that exactly, about it passing from humans to animals. Like, um, Yeah. Uh, it was originated in bats, and then it needed an animal intermediary to get into humans. And um, the one that they've been focusing on is the pangolin, but uh, they're they're still not uh, completely sure about that. So, yeah, yeah, and I, I imagine that research will can continue for sure. Yeah, it's interesting to see the poster here with the way they want to make masks as compared yeah. to uh, what we do masks now. So. Yeah. And the instructions are fairly easy to follow as well. And I think they're trying to provide you with um, materials that most households would have at the time. I think it was cheesecloth, which I think was used quite often for making soups um, and, and broths. And I think it was a fairly common household item. So it's interesting. Yeah. And they don't seem to put it down underneath the chin in, uh, in the uh, picture. So, which yeah, is that's, interesting. That is interesting. Yep. Although they made sure the nose and mouth are covered. <laughs> yeah, and it looks like it goes all the way around the back of the head. Yeah, it kind of crisscrosses. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Thank you for your questions. 
Yeah, no problem. I think Lisa, Lisa had a question uh, that if only 30 are buried in Union, uh, what would be the other cemeteries like that you found any in? Or did you even look for other cemeteries? Because the death records would have mentioned, right? Uh, yes, I did. Um, I did look. There were several where there was no place of burial mentioned. But the other cemeteries that were mentioned, uh, a few were the Roman Catholic uh, Cemetery. Uh, Bowenville Cemetery was mentioned, and there was one in Toronto. But um, quite a few of them just had no no listing. So, you know, as, as I check out um, Union Cemetery records, and if I find these names, um, these 50 people listed, um, I will add them um, in as Union Cemetery. But yes, those were the uh, other cemeteries that were mentioned. Thank you. Oh. The, the, the number of deaths that you mentioned doesn't seem to be very high. Um, yeah. Is that uh, something to do with um, uh, the way the people were living or um, was it just that uh, it didn't uh, hurt uh, certain groups of people? I think it, um, personally, I think it's how it was recorded. And, you know, you're seeing a, a bit of that now with COVID. Sometimes the government will say, um, when they release their daily figures, seven deaths, but so many of those were months before. They go back and check the records. So when I was looking through the death records, um, there, like I said, there was so much pneumonia and, and the doctor may not have just put flu or, um, you know, some doctors put pneumonia following flu and then I included it, but it, if it did not have the word flu somewhere, it wasn't recorded by me. So I'm thinking that uh, there was many more, but just not recorded as the flu. So that, um, that 50 um, was just the, the very minimum, let's say. And even in the, re in the public health report, when it was submitted, they even talked about um, when you mentioned about the living conditions, the living conditions for some weren't great at the time. The war um, had, had affected that as well. Um, unemployment, many people were unemployed. Um, and it's possible that many went unrecorded. Um, like, so it, I just think the recording at the time, like Laura said, it's, um, it was challenging too. They said some people escaped the official recorder, depending on their living conditions. And so, yeah. It's 1918, you got to think it, think of our technology today compared to then. Mm -hmm. um, Janet had another question asking about the method of water purification back in 1905 when there was a diphtheria of a, um, outbreak. Well, they didn't, um, they didn't have a uh, water supply at the time that was coming from the cisterns. Um, it was shown on the fire insurance map. Um, wish I can't. I can bring that up again. If I go back here. So if you see those water tanks that look like blue circles of water, that's the water supply in, in the town at that, like for quite some time. So they wouldn't have had um, purification systems until the, the town put in the waterworks. So it was just whatever water was there they drank, they might've boiled it themselves perhaps. Most but, likely. Yeah. And so many things like this, and especially in our early days, I think we have a particular challenge in Oshawa. We have a sort of a, a, a dead space of no, no newspapers, which are oftentimes the place where you find the most information. Um, and a lot of what Laura was mentioning here was pulled from other reports and other papers. And wouldn't it be wonderful if someone found a treasure trove of all the newspapers from that time period and we would have a lot more answers. Yeah, um, maybe the, yeah. Maybe the obituaries of people, you know, mentioning, you know, how they had died, reports of, yeah of statistics and uh, it's, it's, it's just unfortunate. But uh, like I say, two new papers were donated um, recently. So we'll be getting those, um, those filmed and hopefully that'll shed a little bit more light. Does the uh, National Archives and uh, the Library of Parliament not have any copies of uh, these uh, newspapers? 
Well, if they did, we would have gotten copies of them by now. No, um, unfortunately, no. We have the most complete, between us and the Oshawa Museum, we have the most complete collection of Oshawa newspapers that exist um, because of the Oshawa Times fire and a couple of other things that happened. Um, we weren't collecting systematically across the city at the time when the archive, the Oshawa Times was lost. So there's a huge gap there, but not all the papers from that fire were lost. It's sort of like there were other things as well um, that happened um, <laughs> to lose some of those papers. So it's sort of a yeah, like, kind of... Like the fire at the Oshawa Museum there about five or six years ago. Uh, 20 years ago, I believe. 20 years ago, was it? Uh, uh, 2003. Yeah, a lot of negatives and stuff from the uh, Oshawa Times burned. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's, it's, an it's an unfortunate situation, but, um, you know, we persevere and we find resources in other places. So it's, it's, it's thanks to researchers like Melissa and Laura that we, we know what we do. Um, and um, I'm sure the, uh, the scholarship and research will continue, as Laura said. So uh, I don't know if there's any more questions, but I think... Um, I want to thank both Laura and Melissa for oh, uh, this evening's presentation. Um, it's enlightening. I know when, when I was talking to you earlier this year, and like, of course, at the time when I talked to you in February, we didn't know we'd still be in the middle of all of this. So <laughs> it's, I thought, will it still be relevant in September? Oh, yes. Oh, <laughs> oh yes, it is. Yeah. Um, Fourth <laughs> pandemic. Yeah, it's relevant. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Um, uh, these history presentations that the OPL is doing is uh, wonderful. Um, it's uh, very, very enlightening and uh, to see the uh, history of our city uh, and put on this way. And I would like to mention too that the, um, the Asha Museum and Historical Society host regular speakers as well on topics of, of local history interests. So you might want to check out there and they have their TN talks as well, which are um, happening. Most of our programs these days are happening through Zoom. I presented to the Asha um, the Oshawa Historical Society yesterday, um, but uh, we'll be having more presentations coming up. So please check out either our website or the Oshawa Museum's website for more information. Um, and coming up in November, our history spotlight is going to be a history of Branch 43, Oshawa's Royal Canadian Legion. Um, so we can learn about events leading up to the establishment of the Royal Canadian Legion and the founding of Branch 43 in Oshawa. Um, we have the branch historian Bob Ross and um, Cliff Grenfell of the Western Front Association, um, who will be highlighting their ongoing research um, into the people involved in the founding of the branch and the reasons why it was necessary. So that's in November. So if um, there's no other comments um we will uh say good night for this evening and thank you very much for attending